Okay, let's get started. It's 6.03. Welcome everybody to our board small board meeting and retreat is the main reason we're gathered here today and we have a few items of business today. Uh, so I'm going to call the meeting to order 6.03. Uh, and I have a small change to the agenda and I don't know if anybody else has any others. Uh, I'm, I'm going to add public comments at the end of the meeting because I see a lot of people uh, different people today in the meeting and we didn't have any public comments in our agenda. So uh, I'm gonna put that uh, after, after we come out of our retreat, okay? So that we don't have to compromise in the length of time. Thank you. So let's, could I have a motion to move into executive session? So move. So move. Second, I'll second. Okay, Scott moves and Chris seconds. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, if motion carries. Let's move to executive session, please. Brian, are you in charge of opening? Yes, I'm doing today? it right this second. Yep. Okay, thank you. Yep. Yeah, I don't know if Jim was yeah. here. <laughs> Let's see here. Okay. And I just uh, opened the rooms for the uh, board, for the board you. members. Are there any other board members that I missed out there in the public? Um, am I supposed to do something? Yeah, Dorothy, I, let's make sure I hit the right button here. That might be, hold on, let's see. Am I supposed to go uh, to leave? Yeah, uh, no, right now I got you right here, hold on. Yep, now you go to our breakout room, it just opened for you. I just say join, okay. Yeah, <laughs> thank you, Dorothy. I think I got everyone else, great. We're back. Uh, could I have a motion, please? To approve um, the superintendent's recommendation? Yes, I'll make a motion to approve the superintendent's recommendation uh, about a student's placement for the rest of the year. Second. Second by Caroline. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. Okay. So moving right uh, into personnel, uh, Lindy. <laughs> Just looking for my unmute there. Um, I make a, do I need to do for each heading? I think I do. Okay. Yeah. I make a motion to accept the new teacher nominations for Matthew Palkey as a Rumney math interventionist and Carrie Fitz for East Montpelier math interventionist math teacher. Second. Okay. Lindy moves, Caroline seconds. All those, any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. Any opposed? Having none, the motion carries. Um, the next one, I'll make a motion for a retirement. Uh, for Chip Hedler at Romney as the math technology person. A second? Second. Okay. Do you want can a second? I, can, I, can I just say uh, something yeah. about Chip? I, I, I didn't, I, it's been very difficult to get to know everyone this year in the Zoom world during a pandemic, uh, but I did have the pleasure of working with Chip very closely at the start of the year. Uh, he was on the communications uh, task force with a number of teachers and administrators. And uh, uh, I really uh, got enjoyed my time with him and uh, thought, and I wish him uh, nothing but the best in his uh, future future endeavors and, and his retirement. Jonas, you have your hand up. 
Uh, yeah, I've uh, been able to work with Chip uh, in the negotiations the last couple of years, and uh, he's just a, a lovely guy, great to work with. Uh, he'll be missed. I see Chris McVeigh also has his hand up. You're muted, Chris, sorry. Uh, Chip Hedler has been um, the guardian angel of the Romney School uh, for at least a decade. He has been just the wonderful, uh, he was our enrichment, original enrichment um, a staff member, um, taking math students in to provide them with advanced learning. Uh, he is a, a gentle soul uh, who has a soothing effect on the school and the staff as a whole. Uh, he is utterly dependable. Uh, and the staff member to whom um, other staff members would look um, in times of, of uh, crisis. And Romney School has had them over the past couple of years, over the past decade. Um, so he is um, someone that is not easily replaced in terms of the talents and the skills that he brings, as well as just the influence on the, on the building as a whole, and including students. I don't mean to leave the students out, but he's been an important um, influence, influencer, even though he's not an influencer in the modern sense of that word. Uh, but well, maybe he is, I just, I just don't know, but he's, he's just been wonderful. And he is the, you know, the tribute is he is the Mark Chaplin of the Romney school. Um, so we, we will miss him. Are we Thank ready? You. Thank you, Chris. That was great, everybody. So everybody ready? Any more discussion or can we move? Yeah, okay. All those in favor of approving um, Chip's retirement, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Opposed? The motion carries. We have one more, the um, resignation. Uh, I move to approve the resignation of Alaria Dong, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing it right. Romney music teacher. Do you have a second? A second. Chris seconds. Any, dis any, any discussion? All those in favor of approving Alaria Dong's res resignation, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any opposed? The motion carries. Thank you. All right. So we're going to move on into our retreat. <laughs> uh, Brian, I'm wondering if uh, if you have Susan in the waiting room. <laughs> I actually do not have anyone in the waiting room. Um, where's where's Nick? See. Nick is here. <laughs> Nick's here. <laughs> Nick is here. Where, oh, I see you. Okay. I can try to make a quick call while you're. While you... Yeah, I'll, I'll give her a call while Nick gets us uh, started with the next uh, with the next part of our retreat. So. Hi everyone, glad to see you. Uh, I think we've got essentially uh, two two major issues we're dealing with tonight, and this is not to say that there is a. Uh, this is the final discussion of them. I think it's going to be a continuing discussion and a really vital one for the board uh, in Washington Central. One is what is the essential work of the board and to what extent do members of the board agree on that? And disagreeing is fine, but trying to find common ground, I think is really essential. Uh, the second piece is to focus on the goals of the board. And I think one of the critical issues about goals is if you have them, how do you know, one, that you've accomplished them? And two, if you've accomplished them, what difference does it make in terms of your overall goal? And I'd like to suggest that the board consider that a mission, a, a mission statement uh, in moving forward, which is that the mission of any public school system is to provide the skills and knowledge 
that students need uh, to need to have so that they have choices. And what I mean by having choices is once they leave public education, whether they choose to get involved in a relationship, go to community college, go to vocational school, go into the military, go to college, wherever they choose to go, that they have the skills to have those choices and don't feel that they're making those choices by default. Uh, for example, some students feel that they're really good at, good at English, but they don't necessarily like math. Well, it doesn't mean that they shouldn't have math skills. It means that they should know math well enough to decide what they like to do and what they don't like to do. Um, I'd also like to suggest a three-part focus um, as we move forward into the retreat and to ongoing discussions. One is a focus on learning, uh, meaning is the district in your view focused on student learning? The second is a focus on results. Uh, there were concerns expressed at the last retreat about results in certain areas. And one of the questions I think the board has to face is what are your expectations about student results? What do you expect students to know and be able to do by the time they're out of elementary school, by the time they're out of middle school, by the time they're out of high school? Um, and if you ask students five years out from the time they leave 12th grade, what did you learn that you found was helpful? And what do you wish you would learn? What do you think the answers are gonna to be to that? Uh, not very many school, school districts actually do that, incidentally, but it's a very useful kind of thing to do. Um, the, the three notions about the retreat that I'd like to recommend to the board are, as we talked about at the last retreat, one being hard on the issues, but soft on people. You know, it's very easy when you're disagreeing with somebody to get very critical of the person as opposed to focusing on what the issue is that you're concerned about. And in that vein, to the extent that board members can focus on the kind of active listening that we talked about the last retreat, I think that'll be very helpful. The third piece is purely mechanical. Um, if you're sitting in a room where there's TV or kids or dogs running around, if you can kind of keep their presence limited, it may help you. Uh, the same kind of thing with cell phones. So other than that, that's my introduction. Floor. I want to and just take back a little bit. Oh, my inner. So that's better. I'm going to have to go get some people off. Introduce Susan Holson and all tradition so that we make sure that everybody knows. You. I think. She was well, well, breaking up, I think. Oh, sorry, Brian, you were just going to do it. I think yeah, you got it. <laughs> to have everybody introduce themselves because we do have uh, new board members. I think that's what she was trying to say. Is that, do you agree, Brian? Yes, yeah. and I think uh, we had, uh, then I have Susan Holson introduce herself and then I think turn it over to Susan. Yep. Thank you. I thought I, thought I heard her mumbling my name in there. Um, I, for those of you whom I don't know, my name is Susan Holson. I am the Director of Education Services at the Vermont School Boards Association. And Floor, on behalf of your board, has invited me to um, kick off the retreat, working in concert with Nick, um, really to focus on the question of the board's role, the superintendent's role, how they mesh, how they separate um, where those lines are. But I certainly don't want to get in the way of new board member introductions. So if that's on the table, let's certainly start with that. So do we want to start off with uh, just every board member just introducing okay. themselves real quick? Is that the plan? Sure. Okay. 
So I, I don't know is if this is the first time this board has been seated together. No. Okay. No. No. Do we want so to start? I'll start. I'll start. I'll start. My, name is, my name is Chris McVeigh. How are you, Susan? Thank you for I'm coming. Fine. Thanks, Chris. How are you? I'm well. Do we just jump in? I'm Lindy Please. Johnson. Um, I live in East Montpelier and have been on the board for quite a while. Hi. Hi, this is Jill Olson. I, I live in Middlesex. Sorry, no, that's okay. You uh, Jill Olson uh, from, thanks. Jill Olson from Middlesex. As you can see, I'm in a car that I am not driving, um, but I am listening on the phone. <laughs> okay, be careful. Caroline May, also from Middlesex. Um, Dorothy Naylor, Nick, I wasn't at the meeting in September, but I was on the board at the time. Um, I was a little bit uncomfortable uh, with the COVID and so forth as I'm very, I'm in my 80s and my husband's almost 90. So we were being very protective. Don't blame you at all. Hi, I'm Christina Pollard. I live in Worcester um, and I have been on the board since March. So I'm fairly new. <laughs> I think we'll call that new. Okay. <laughs> Good evening. My, my name is Kari Bradley. I live in Callis, Vermont. And I think this is my eighth year on one of these Washington Central boards. Excellent. I'm Scott Thompson, also from Callis. Um, and I've been rattling around one board or another for 13 years now. Wow. Thanks. How are you, Scott? Uh, this is Steve Look. Uh, I'm from East Montpelier, and uh, I have some board experience as well. Hi, I'm Diane Nichols Fleming. I live in Berlin. I've been on the board about a year and I might have to have my camera off because my internet's a little spotty. Get it. <laughs> I'm Jonasina Van Fleet. I'm from Worcester. Uh, I was also remote during the, uh, during the, uh, the retreat over the summer. Um, this is uh, approaching the end of my second uh, full year on the board, but the I'm in the third year of my term. This is the only school board experience I have. Nice to see you, Jonas. I, I, I'm I, sorry. One more thing. One more thing. The my outgoing video appears to be working, but my incoming video is not working. So at some point, I'm going to take the opportunity and just restart my browser and, and enter back in. I can't. Floor left. Did Floor introduce? I think we all know Floor, but. Can you guys hear me now? Uh, yes, much better. I'm so much better. Now we lost you again. A little, a little spotty. <laughs> and I think we have also Vera Fraser here as well. I don't, I don't know if yes. she's. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 So um, my name is Vera Frazier and I live in Berlin. Um, I've been on the board for, well, I was on the board for 12 years, took a year off, and now I'm back on. Welcome back. Thank you. Welcome, Vera. It's nice to meet you. You too. Thanks. I, I hope that you can hear me now. Not great. Out for some reason. How to get it because it's so you know me and floor I, this is my 11th year as a board. super excited about our future and excited that we're holding this retreat is susan is that the board and, uh, I, there's so many That's people on the call. I, I'm not quite sure who's bored and who isn't, um, which is one of the interesting pieces of Zoom, uh, Zoom land. Uh, but it is very nice to meet those of you I haven't met, and I look forward to being able to actually meet you in person, hopefully someday soon. Um, and thank you all for being here. Who, who is actually the host of this meeting? Can I get permission to share my screen? 
Sure, I can do that. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so what I wanted to do tonight is just sort of go through quickly a little bit of background on um, the genesis of school boards in Vermont. We are, we are creatures actually invented by the, the legislature and the state. The school board existence is laid out in statute. Um, and as such, there are certain parameters that we must follow and others that we at VSBA have identified over time as being best practices um, based on what we've seen, what our colleagues across the country have seen at other state associations and what the National School Boards Association has also um, researched and been able to identify throughout, uh, sort of threads throughout. So recognizing that Vermont is its own, yes, Brian. Yeah, would, you, would it be easier if you, I'll let you talk and I can put it up and you can just tell me to do the slides? Would that be easier? Um, I, I, either way. Okay. I, I can do this, but okay. somebody's now waiting to get in. Shall I admit them? <laughs> yes, please. Okay. It depends on who it is. <laughs> well, I suppose that probably does, doesn't it? Um, okay. But you should add that I made you the co-host, Susan. So yep. You should be able to yep. share. Okay. Okay. Let's see. If I can do this, that's not what I want to share. <laughs> there we go. Hmm. Oops. Okay, we're getting there. So, uh, with your indulgence, I'm going to run through some of this and then we'll um, have an opportunity to really open up and have, have a discussion about what your expectations were whenever it was that you first joined a board, what your expectations have been as you've lived through two years now of a merger? Do I have, no, one year, one complete year? Two, okay, thank you. <laughs> um, and, and whether that's changed your ideas at all about what a board, what a board's role is, um, because it does seem to take on a slightly different um, texture when you're dealing with a larger district. Um, <clears throat> and so we'll go from there. So we're going to talk about the board's roles and responsibilities and the superintendent's roles and responsibilities. And I will be leaning on the Vermont School Boards Association um, platform that we've developed called the Essential Work of Vermont School Boards, which again borrows from the National School Boards Association, but really tailors everything to Vermont's education system and our laws and our, our uh, local control issues with local boards that still have to answer to the state. And of course, our state funding system is truly unique. I will skip through this introductions portion because you've just done the, the introduction. So the powers of school boards, as I mentioned, are laid out in statute. I know that the type on this slide is too small to read and it's really okay because the, my intent here was not so much to show what the individual responsibilities are, but rather to show that they're pretty, there's a long list here, right? Um, and so when I distill it down, there are 32 powers of the boards and the, the things that are really salient in that list for all boards under any circumstances are the board determines educational policies for your district, your unified district. You are responsible for sound fiscal management and accountability, which means um, making sure once you have an approved budget that the spending, the actual spending of the school district is in line with the budget. Um, and finally, preparing and distribution of a budget, which you do 
collaboratively with the superintendent and, and the central office staff. But ultimately, of course, the board has to sign off on the budget and then it goes to your voters. Um, the as a school board, because you're elected, you are a public body, so you have to abide by certain laws that are granted or required of public bodies, including the open meeting law, which we could do a couple of hours just on that alone. In fact, I did that last night. Um, and Robert's Rules of Order is uh, is actually laid out in the in the statute as being the uh, protocol for running a board meeting. Um, and finally, you establish, establish policies and procedures specifically uh, about conf board member conflict of interest. And that's not just actual conflict of interest, but also, and it says here clearly, the appearance of board member conflict of interest. And in Vermont, with our small towns, sometimes that appearance is more of a factor than the actual reality. <laughs> um, and yet it's so important to remember that if it looks like there's a conflict of interest, it doesn't matter whether there's one or not because it looks like there is. And so people believe that there's a problem. So what is the role of a board? Well, it's, it's really, pretty fundamental. You're responsible for ensuring that the tools are in place to have a high quality education for every student. And that's every student. That the public gets a good return on its investment. In other words, that you're monitoring the progress of your students and the outcomes of your system. And that your system is operating efficiently, effectively, ethically. And my colleagues always like me to add in their legally. Um, and so what does that mean? Well, think of it as the board going first and last. Um, it, you're first in the sense that you're setting the vision, you're mm -hmm. setting the policies, the parameters and the priorities on how the board, uh, how, how the district will, will utilize its resources. Um, last, because you're going to monitor the what's actually going on to make sure that it's aligned with that vision that you've established with those policies that you've established with the budget that you've established so you check in at the beginning you check in at the end in between times is where the superintendent is actually managing the system so i mentioned that vermont school boards association has developed this um platform that we call the essential work of school boards. This is the landing page actually from the essential work toolkit from our website. And there are six different pieces to this. We call them domains. You can call them whatever you want to. Um, and they're all critical components of board's work. But the one we're gonna focus on today is that relationship with the superintendent because at the core, that's really where you know, where the rubber meets the road, right? Um, because that's where the broad thinking of the board, the visionary thinking of the board and the policies of the board make that transition into the operations. And that's like, as I said, where, where the superintendent pretty much takes over. Um, so the board's job is really governance. And that's a term we throw around a lot where school board work is concerned. And I think, especially for those of you who are new to the board, that's not a word that's in most people's everyday vernacular. And, and so I want to break it down a little bit. So I went to Miriam Webster, my favorite source for these things, and they broke their own rules and used the word governing right in the definition. So they define governance as the act or process of governing or overseeing the control and direction of something. Governing, they say, is to exercise continuous sovereign authority over, especially to control and direct the making of policy, 
oh, excuse me, making an administration of policy. And I've got that cut off there and I apologize for that. But the point is, this is at the policy level. You are overseeing the control, but you're not actually controlling or directing the school district. You're overseeing that. What does that mean? Well, one of the biggest and most important things a school board does is you hire your superintendent to lead and manage the district. And here he is. Nice picture, Brian. Um, so why, why did you choose Brian when you were hiring your superintendent last year? Because he has the experience and the credentials and the educational expertise to manage your school district, right? He, I, I can't speak to your board, but most school board members around the state are not educators. They can't be experts, therefore, in the curriculum and the classroom practices and, and the whole management of what goes on in the school. And therefore, that's why we have a superintendent, because in this case, he is the expert. The state State also defines the superintendent as being the CEO of your school district. So if you want to take that and compare it to a, a corporate structure, right, where you have uh, a hired president and then a board of directors, the board of directors doesn't run the business on the on a day to day basis. The board of directors gets a report from the president, usually quarterly, about how it's going, meaning in a case of a corporation, usually it's a profit statement. And, and then if there are ancillary issues that they need to address, uh, they certainly do so with the board and the board provides oversight and high level um, reflection on the actual day-to-day -day as the superintendent, as the CEO chooses to share that. Um, so the superintendent is really accountable for all of the operations of the entire school system. And he's, he's accountable to you, to the board. And you, meanwhile, are accountable to your community that your schools are going to be well managed and that your students are going to have the outcomes that reflect the, com the community's values and the vision that you've established. So what, according to, I'm back to the law book, um, the superintendent has a list of, of duties that are stipulated also. And, and it's, you'll notice a shorter list. Now that doesn't mean that it's less work, right? <laughs> because each of these is pretty complicated, but they have specific um, duties that are assigned to them as, as that CEO, that top uh, educator, and you have your duties. So when we compare them side by side, um, the board is accountable to the voters and the superintendent is accountable to the board. Both of you or all of you are subject to state laws and regulations. The board then adopts the goals for the districts, approves the continuous improvement plans, employs and evaluates the superintendent, holds the superintendent accountable for developing a strategy and a work plan, and reviews and provides feedback to the superintendent annually to make sure that you're all on the same path. And I, at the risk of reading this slide to you, um, the superintendent makes sure that, that everything that he's doing operationally is consistent with the vision and the bigger goals and the strategic goals that the board is establishing. So that's his job is, is to deliver on the goals that the board has established. And I know you're gonna be working on goals later on this evening with Nick. And, and this is where you need to make sure you have buy-in from the superintendent, but at the end of the day, it's the board that gets, um, has a voice in identifying what it is you want to see as, as the finished product, if you will. 
so there, the this is a real distillation of that four or five page document that I had sent out ahead of time prepared by the Agency of Education on the respective roles of the players in the educational leadership. But the board sets the goals. You make sure that there's good, clear communication between board and administration. And then you have your process for monitoring. Whereas the superintendent, as the chief executive officer, is responsible for the operations of the district and also educational leadership to the edu professional educators and is accountable to, in your case, a, a district board, a unified district board. The principals, meanwhile, are at the building level and they, they're sort of a microcosm. They manage what goes on in the building. They are instructional leaders. They are in, they, they work with the faculty to ensure that everybody is being effective at their job. So professional development at an evaluative setting is part of that job. And the principals are accountable to the superintendent. And everything that goes on at each school has to be consistent with what's going on at the unified uh, level in terms of moving towards common goals. And you, you've probably seen this chart before. This is in order to make sure that you have a, a really qualified and capable superintendent, you need to stress the mutual accountability. So the board is accountable to the superintendent to make sure that the policies are appropriate and um, relevant and that the resources that are necessary to accomplish the vision that the board's established are in place to do the job. And, and then they also have some accountability, not formally to the superintendent, but to make sure that the superintendent has the tools that he needs to do his job. And the superintendent is accountable to the board you know, he's your only hire. He's the only the only employee of the board. And then the principals are accountable to the superintendent. And similarly, the teachers are accountable to the principal, you know, and, and so it goes. So that's sort of the basic structure. And I'm going to stop sharing here. Oh, there you all are. Um, and, and I want to really open this conversation. I want to open this up now. So the first question I, I want to ask you is, as you read through the document that I circulated from the agency, were there any surprises? And please feel free to do this informally and, and jump in with your answers. Anybody see anything in there that struck you as unlikely or different from what you're doing currently? Okay. And how did that, did you like the way that those jobs were laid out? Was that consistent with what you think a board's job is and what you think a superintendent's job is? Yes, I'm sorry, I don't have, oh, Carl, is I it? Can... Kari, yeah, I, I take a shot at it. I, I didn't find it uh, surprising. I, it's um, fairly typical, I think, uh, structure for or, you know sort of management theory, governance theory. Um, I do. You asked the question: Is it different? And I, I do think, I do think that we're still finding our way towards that model and how to really implement it. Um, so, for example, I think we have some clarity about what we expect from Brian and from the system, but I don't think we have a lot of clarity around how we measure that, how we monitor it, or even how we plan for it and provide all the supports that Brian's ultimately gonna need. And, and you know, I, to some extent that's understandable uh, since we're new and Brian's new to working with us, but I, you know, I think um, the structure makes sense to me. Okay, thanks. How about some of you who have been long serving board members from the, coming from the small legacy boards? Chris? Um, so did you say that the CEO, superintendent, 
um, only needs to share what information with the board that they decide to share? No, th I'm sorry. I, if, if I said that, I misspoke. What uh, they So first of all, you want to have open channels with the superintendent so that the, the, there's not a sense of um, concealing anything. But the responsibility of the superintendent is to show the board progress towards achieving the goals. So whatever you, the board and the superintendent collectively agree on as good sources of evidence of that progress are the things that are important for the board to see. Um, so I, I think the, um, the structures that are laid out here are probably more rigid than what the way we've operated as a board over time. Um, I think we encourage more of a, a mutual give and take in terms of uh, decision making and things like that. Certainly the uh, superintendent is our CEO, um, but uh, not a dictator. And, and so, you know, I, I think this, the way that, did you say this came from the Agency of Education? Yes. Okay. Um, and I see you said the statutory parts, but so I think it's, it's probably more rigidly laid out than what we have been uh, in the practice of. Um, and I also don't believe that the superintendent is the only employee of the board. Um, I think the entire, all the employees of the districts are the, are the employees in the district are the employees of the district, not the employees of the superintendent. Superintendent certainly has powers of, of discharge, um, but not of hire. Um, um, of hire for non-licensed. For, for non-licensed, correct, but not for licensed positions. Right. So, you know, there's, there's, um, yeah, there's give and take, I think. And, okay, uh, fair enough. Yeah. And, and I, uh, just to clarify for those of you who may be newer and not as familiar, um, the superintendent's obligation when it comes to hiring licensed employees is to bring, to put forth to the board only one candidate for each licensed position, which means that he or his designees have gone through a process to, to narrow a field to one candidate that they that he would like to have as the to fill the position. Um, and I want to come back to that, Chris. I want to come back to your um, your notion of give and take. But let's hear from Scott. Sure. Thank you very much. I guess I can't say that it surprises me, but um, I think. Um, with all of the detail in this, some of which is very useful, um, I think the core has has somehow um, been obscured, and that is that um, that we have been really dramatically transformed um, compared to what we were before. Uh, and if I were to boil it down, all of this into sort of two observations. Um, we, the board, have no ability to accomplish anything significant without the superintendent. And the superintendent has no authority to accomplish anything significant without the board. I mean, essentially, we have been remade into a single functional unit in a um, in kind of a symbiotic association where um, we have complementary subfunctions that form um, a, a working entity, but we are joined not just at the hip, but in the hippocampus or <laughs> in the head. Um, and this is this is completely different from our previous practice where, um, essentially, the superintendent was our was every board's best frenemy. Um, where we would we would police the frontier between you know our um, local board and school um, authority and scope of action, um, and guard it pretty jealously against in 
intrusions from the central office. Uh, it was, you know, there was a lot of that dynamic going on, um, making sure that, uh, that, you know, the central office confined its, its ambitions to uh, what it needed to do and left the schools and the boards to, um, in their uh, semi-autonomous way, to function as we used to function. That is completely gone now. And uh, we cannot, um, I, th I think for me, I know, um, and perhaps for others of us on the board, um, I don't want to speak for anybody but myself, um, it's taken a real effort to, to get to that awareness that um, uh, essentially the, the superintendent is to the new board, to the new consolidated board, as say the principal used to be to the, to the old board. We're, um, uh, the superintendent is no longer, the, the dynamic is no longer sort of um, uh, kind of uh, creative tension, I guess would be the nicest way to put it between board and superintendent. Um, the, the dynamic is, is really um, board and superintendent working together and sorting things out among each other, the same way board members sort things out among ourselves, you know, through deliberation, debate, discussion, asking questions, um, you know, just uh, holding people's feet to the fire. Um, Brian's soles of his shoes are undoubtedly nicely singed by now, but, um, but it's not where we're trying to hobble the superintendent or, or rein him in. Um, he is the only way that we, as a board, can get anything done. And it takes, I think, a, um, for me anyway, it has taken uh, a while to arrive at this understanding, which I think is the only way that we can actually make great things happen for our, for our school system. How did the rest of you feel about what Scott just said? What are your reactions to that? Um, I, Let, I, let's hear I from wanna... Jonas first. I saw his hand first and then Steven and then Chris. And then um, if I see more hands, I'll let you know. Um, I, I, I can't see anyone, but I want to thank Scott for that really, really eloquent description of the difference between, you know, now and, and you know, the before time. Um, I'd never heard it um, sort of articulated like that, um, and it makes a lot of sense to me. Um, having come on, you know, right at that inflection point, um, that relationship between superintendent and board uh, has seemed natural and self-evident to me from day one. Um, so Scott, I really appreciate you, your, your perspective on that. That really fills in a lot of gaps for me. Steven? Um, so I can't be 100% sure this is directly in response to what Scott said. Um, I've, I've always felt <clears throat> that our, when we had separate districts, there was never full alignment or um, commonality of practice from one board to another. Each board, each district, town district, um, building, building district, was unique of itself. It functioned differently. It had different expectations. Um, there were some common threads, but there was also some differences. Um, and that was frequently seen at the supervisory board level. Um, but it, in the past, I think it was a um, no harm, no foul kind of a attitude that Yes, you do things differently than we do things, but um, you know we can all get along and <laughs> accept our differences. 
Whereas now, and I think this is the difference that Scott was alluding to, <clears throat> that doesn't exist anymore. There's just one and it's coming, um, I think coming to a common alignment, a common language, common expectations. And uh, it, it could be a good sign from what Jonas added to the conversation. I, I don't think it's a, <clears throat> it's not difficult. It's just a conversation that needs to be had and, and common understanding needs to be developed. And I think we're moving in that direction. Thanks. Chris. Um, I would agree that the superintendent has a primary role, but I also think it's not the sole primary role. I see um, our, our district as having uh, more diffuse um, responsibilities amongst, primarily amongst the principals, leadership team. Um, and you know, I just, I, I, I think saying that the superintendent is the one who makes it go or doesn't, um, doesn't give enough credit to all the other uh, uh, that move us along on the goals that we are trying to attain. Um, I, I certainly agree that the superintendent is the primary manager of that. I don't think superintendent is the expert in all the educational areas because that's probably impossible. And that's why we have a director of curriculum and expertise. Um, he's the primary manager of making the whole um, organization move. Um, but the, uh, the um, motivational responsibilities are more diffuse than just the superintendent to me. Yeah, mm -hmm. good point. And, and of course, mm -hmm. like in any management structure, um, the manager delegates responsibilities to others who have been selected to be in their roles for their expertise, right? And, and so that gives the superintendent the opportunity to fill those gaps of his own no, I mean, we all have our strengths and our weaknesses, right? So you want to make sure, sure. you know, a, a, the best educator in the world may be a really terrible bookkeeper. And ultimately, the superintendent needs to have a really good grasp on the finances. So, you know, th those kinds of partnerships internally are critical. And I don't mean to sell them short. It's, but from your seat, at the board table, your contact is through the superintendent. He then has the responsibility of keeping all of the rest of the team motivated and, and moving towards progress on the board's stated goals, right? So I, I think we're not disagreeing here. We're just sort of different vantage points. Susan? Yes. I'd like to suggest in line with what you've already been doing that we go around and do as you were, you have been just asking each board member yep. to respond to what you've been saying, because I think it's a very important set of conversations. Well, I've got two hands up now from people we've not heard from. So why don't we start there and then we'll continue. Thanks for that suggestion, Nick. Um, I see Floor's hand, but I don't see Floor. So I'm not sure. Are you really there, Floor? I am here. Can you guys hear me now? I yes. Think yes. The internet tested, even though it's still saying unstable. But uh, so I want to say, I, I, I first want to thank Scott for saying what he said is really powerful coming <laughs> from, from Scott to all of us, because I think we all, like Stephen was saying, we all have been operating in different districts. And, uh, and I always, you know, felt like we got a lot of uh, student outcomes and a lot of other things done when we operated as a whole. And I'm excited for the progress that we've made so that we can make sure that we can really monitor now. And I think that's the one thing that I could add is that I think what we're confusing, just listening to Chris talk to, I think is, I completely agree with what you're saying. Our point of contact is the superintendent. And when it comes to monitoring and creating the the culture, we, we are counting as a superintendent to have a collaborative culture in, you know, I've said this to Brian all the time, not a, a bottom up, not a top down. And, and that's more about creating 
culture, when it comes to monitoring, it, that is when we as a, as a board hearing from different uh, key stakeholders uh, and getting reports from different, that's where we, when we can hear from this uh, other people to make sure that we're uh, getting uh, information from the people on the ground and, um, and, and feel more empowered to, uh, feel more empowered, but also understand what's going on on the ground. So, but that comes to me in the monitoring part. So not for micromanaging the superintendent, but to, to properly create a system that is a collaborative. So similar to what we do in the quality committee, right? Uh, Jen comes and she reports to us. And that's when it, by the superintendent creating that, those partnerships, it allows us to have that, uh, that I think Chris is allowing too. But um, there were no surprises, but uh, thank you Scott for those comments. Thanks, Floor. Vera? Hi, um, yeah, so I agree with um, what Scott's statement was. I think the, the part for me with serving on a board um, for 13 years, I, I've seen a lot change, um, change can be good, but I think our individual towns still have, I mean, each individual town wants its individuality and I think it's hard when, um, as one board, we're trying to approach everything in a cookie cutter way. And we, I know for when working through the Act 46, um, one of the difficult parts that we always ran into is every town still wanted its individuality. So how do we do that as a full board and all work together for common goals, but still keep the towns uh, you know, some of the individuality that each town has, whether it's um, choices in classes that they take or different budgetary needs, different ways of um, school events happening, you know, the list can go on and on, but it's, it's working together as one board, but still keeping the individu individuality of each school. Okay. And at the end of the day though, my question to you about that, and you don't have to answer this, just think on it, okay? Is yep. do you think that the residents of different towns within the district want different things for their kids ultimately? Yes, yeah. I do. I'm, I, 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 yes. And I, I'll think about that some more to come back with some more on that. But yeah, at the end of the day, I do think there are differences. Okay. I, I'm eager to hear more. Okay. Um, so thank you. Yep. Is it Caroline? Do I have your pronunciation right? Caroline. Caroline, Caroline. I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, you wanna chime in? I feel like I, I agree with everything that's been said. Um, I had watched uh, a lot of this when I was deciding if I would uh, come back onto the board. And um, the part that stood out for me tonight was, again, that piece of the superintendent being our only employee, the superintendent being accountable to the board. We as a board are accountable to the community and all other employees are accountable to the superintendent. I think that's huge. And I think that that stresses the importance of accountability and how essential that piece of our role and our relationship with the superintendent really is. So thank you. Well, thank you. I, I don't want to be calling on people and embarrassing you, but I do want to hear from everybody. So if you're not going to step up and volunteer, I will call you out, but I'd rather not have to. Um, I would go if you, okay, if you want someone free. else. Thank you. So, sure. So uh, what's coming up for me is that, I, you know, I think that these kinds of delineations of roles and responsibilities work really well as long as there's trust and communication. And that's really the foundation of it. And as soon as any of that falls apart, then it's impossible to maintain your own position. Uh, particularly, um, I think as Caroline was talking about, we have an obligation to our communities. And so 
we need to be able to speak to the communities with, um, you know, with clear understanding of what's actually happening. That's our oversight role. And so that's the pressure that I think we as board members feel. And I think that um, when the superintendent really understands that that's our pressure and our reality, we actually have, a, it's easier to maintain the, the sort of lanes that, that you're describing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and, and back to Chris's earlier point, these are um, lanes, but they're not different highways, right? <laughs> they're all going to the same place. Um, they're just splitting out the responsibilities, perhaps differently than you've looked at it some, somewhat in the past. Um, and, and occasionally you drift into the other lane and, and usually somebody honks at you if you're interfering, right? And, and so while that document um, may appear to be rigid, I think is what you were alluding to, Chris, um, yeah. You know, in practice, every district has to be able to make it work for yourselves. Um, but if you have a basic common understanding of what that what your lane is, I think it means that you're going to um, self-monitor and and as a board i don't mean individually but i mean as a board if, if somebody's crossing way into an operational zone um it's incumbent on the rest of the board to say hey that's not ours you know that's not our work let's make sure that we're clear with with brian what it is we hope to see as an end result and then he'll tell us how he's going to get get us there and, and that, that may be a dialogue, right? But I just want to appreciate the, high, the highway analogy while I'm in my car. So thank, thank you. you for that. <laughs> I think maybe you, you might have just sparked that in me because <laughs> I can see out your window there. <laughs> Who have I'm, I'm not driving. I just want everybody to know. I'm not driving. <laughs> Who have we not heard from yet? I know there are a few of you. You have Lindy there with her hand up, Susan. Ah, I'm sorry, Lindy. You, you popped to right. a different corner on my screen. Thank you for. Yeah, I think when you put your hand up, it pops you into another position because that's oh, when maybe. I moved. Um, I think what Jill was saying about trust, um, it doesn't really matter who is the boss or who is the not the boss. Trust is so important. And building that as we become one board from six or seven boards. There were a lot of boards for such a small number of students who actually go through our system. And I say that an awful lot, I know, but um, we are not a huge corporation. So when I hear CEO, I think we're not a huge corporation and the communication should feel comfortable and trusting. And I'm not sure that's been built yet, but um, Brian's new and we're still building that culture and communication and we've had some bumps but I I see that on this form where it says school boards are accountable to voters well I think we are accountable to voters we're vote accountable to the staff to make sure that our schools are safe our places of learning not just um, the outcomes necessarily and um, I think that's an area that maybe we need some work. I've been one of the ones who is not happy with public comment at the end of meetings and it doesn't, hasn't changed yet, but we're working on it. So um, there's just some bumps. And I think building that trust is really important for the collaboration among us and among the staff and the superintendent. So I think that's a focus. And, and you really are dealing with two different trust issues, right? I mean, you've, to Scott's earlier point, you had to come together against what a lot of your wishes were. And it was hard to trust that you all wanted to be moving in the same direction, right? So you had to build trust 
among yourselves. And, and that's a long, uh, building trust is an ongoing process, right? And then on top of that, you've got a new superintendent. So there's another trust relationship. And, and these things are hard enough when they're isolated, but when you've got them stacked on top of each other, it can be a, a really challenging, challenging process. Um, I'm really enthusiastic about what I'm hearing tonight because it seems as though you're really all being very reflective about the process, which means you're you're recognizing that it's worth that energy. Christina. Um, so being brand new to the board, um, I don't know what it was like when it was six or seven separate boards, um, which I think can be both a blessing and a curse. Um, but I do want to say that, you know, this is a total like learning curve for me and something brand new, but I think the way that everything was laid out um, in the document has really helped me understand kind of what our position is here on the board. Um, and I'm excited to learn more as we continue. Great. I'm going to put in a selfless plug for the um, first year journey training that VSBA is doing in May in two parts. I hope I'll see you there. Yes, definitely. Great. Diane. Yes, yeah, so it, it this has been very helpful. So it's helpful to have it laid out in a very clear format. Um, but I think as what's been said already, communication, trust, and also that accountability is how we develop that accountability. So I think that's what we're we're working through and trying to come with that common vision of what that means and what the culture is that we want to create um, across the board. So I think it helps each, I hear each part differently each time I hear it. So it's good to have it repeated um, and to have the opportunity to explore it too as a group. Great, thank you. Dorothy. Uh, yes, well, um, this has been very interesting listening to the various things which has made me think of how it's all fit together. Um, I was on the Callis Elementary Board before I moved into the larger board. And a, one thing came to mind with what Scott had to say and how things are moving forward. And when Scott described the five small boards, or six, the five elementary schools and the high school, <clears throat> He indicated quite rightly that it was the local board and the principals who had a really strong relationship and the local board kind of looked askance at the central office or, or didn't really want to trust them, that they felt they and the principal were the most important things. So I'm wondering if one of the things we haven't figured out how to do is to transfer that trust from the principal to the superintendent, any superintendent, but now we have a new one. And maybe that's something that our board needs to be aware of that we need to, to show Brian more trust than we have. The other thing that struck me was a couple of people said that they're responsible to their community. And I'm thinking um, most people, the way I read what people are saying is that they're really still thinking of their community of the town where they come from rather than that nice outline of the five towns that is really your community, our community. And before COVID set in and the first year, um, I, had a, I had a goal of going and visiting the schools when they were in session, like having going to the morning opening stuff in Middlesex or, or something in East Montpelier or, or those things. I, I wanted to go to the various schools just to see them in operation and to feel part of their building. 
and I really would recommend that all our board members, I know I am retired. Um, I have a lot to do at home, as most of you know, but um, I was hoping I could do that. And I'm hoping that some of you can find the time to go to the other buildings. Um, I, Worcester, that was, I, I wanted to go to all of them. And um, I didn't get that done. Um, I'm hoping some of you can find the time to do that because I really don't think all of us really think in terms of representing all five towns. Possibly people that, who were on the U32 board do because you then were representing all five towns. But I, I think those of us who run the elementary school board um, may still have that narrower view. And we need to work very hard at trusting the superintendent once we give him something to do. I really appreciate what you were just saying. Um, when I served on a board, I served on an elementary school board and later on the high school board within the same supervisory union. And it was very much structured similarly to you where it was a union uh, uh, high school. And what I learned when I got to the union high school board fascinated me because the ninth grade teachers could pretty well tell within the first week of classes which of the elementary schools the student came from, any given student came from. And they could do that because the, the what we call sending schools all had different strengths and weaknesses. And while the goal of the unification was not to homogenize and turn them into cookie cutters, it was to make sure that your students are all getting the best they can get. And, you know, when my kids showed up at high school and the ninth grade teacher just sort of shrugged his shoulders in the science class and said, oh, I don't expect any of you to know it. You all come from that school. Um, and they just accepted that as the way it was. And, and my kids ended up going through high school dragging their feet in science because they never had that foundation. So I would be happy to know that because of consolidation and because a board is now thinking in that bigger picture, that that kind of um, transition is, is remedy. That's not to say I want all the schools to be exactly the same, but I want the students to have similar opportunities that which may translate differently. In, into what the specifics are, but they still have the same developmental and educational opportunities. And I also want to say one other thing to what you said, Dorothy, because this is very interesting to me also. As I look around the state at the, the uh, practices of the, the unified districts, the ones that have been unified in the last six, seven years with Act 46, most have the format that you do where your towns elect representatives either based on the student population or the census population or however it's decided what the comp or three from each town, whatever the composition of the board is. But there are actually some unified boards, newly unified boards, where all board members are elected at large by the voters of all the communities. Um, that's the way our boards run. So you're all elected? We all have to be elected on the ballot for every community. Oh, that's wonderful. I, I thank you for clearing that well, up. But with, with the caveat that each town has a certain number of representatives. Okay. So it's not... So you, know, you get both. You can't be all... You get yes. the best of both worlds. Um, but but to Dorothy's the point, then you really are then representing the broader community. Oh yeah, and and that's a, a huge leap as you're transitioning through all of this. Have we heard from all the board members? I think so. Brian, can I pick on you? Of Do course. You have I mean, you've got skin in this game, but do you have any um, anything you'd like to contribute to this conversation? 
Uh, well, uh, you know, I'm, uh, it's very, I'm sitting here and, uh, and, and I'm, I'm extremely excited about having you here and Nick here uh, and talking about uh, this conversation. And I'm hearing what uh, the board is saying. And I do think, uh, you know, that building trust is a big thing, right? Um, and I think, and I, I have, and I heard a lot of different things. At first I heard, you know, here, here's what I've heard folks have said. Uh, a lot of us, thanks, thanks to Scott for his uh, comment to start off, launch, the, uh, launch this. Uh, coming to an alignment across uh, our communities needs to happen. Uh, at the uh, there is differences of opinion around the, the superintendent role as as someone who is the only employee of the board versus someone who is a manager uh, but is not an expert in everything. Um, I've heard that uh, you know we need to create a collaborative system, and the superintendent needs to work on creating a partnership. Uh, I've heard about the uh, our individual towns want 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 their individuality, uh, and one board. Uh, it should approach it not in a cookie cutter way. Uh, I know that uh, there's more conversation about the superintendent being its only employee. And I, I, I talk about the, uh, a, a lot of folks talked about this idea of trust and how do we build trust? And I thought it was very interesting uh, where someone, someone said the old model of the SU model uh, and the actual district model and how different they are and you know, I thought it was a very interesting comment about how to build trust. And lots of folks who have worked under the SU model uh, have a uh, strong relationship of trust with uh, the principals and how that, uh, how uh, the, some folks uh, believe, and I'm hoping that that happens as well, that we can build more trust with the superintendent. And, and uh, cause I think that's what the school district, a unified district will require. Uh, so I thought it was a, I thought it was a very uh, productive uh, conversation, but I do think that the trust piece is a huge piece. And I'm so sorry that you're not able to have this retreat in person because there is opportunity when you get outside of your regular business and we get into these kinds of conversations that are about how you operate as a board and, and also the goal setting portion of it, um, to have the opportunity to really be sharing in that experience is is hard to replace and i would say that uh the in my experience i've been here uh i don't know nine months ten months ten months uh and i find my my experience is we have really a lot of really great things here at washington central uh we have outstanding teachers we're one of the only districts that have uh, reopened this throughout the state since the beginning of the year uh i can't uh talk about how, how how proud i am of our teachers and staff I think the leadership team has a lot of intelligent, really hardworking people. I think our board uh, really cares a lot about their communities uh, and, and the district. So I just feel like there's a lot of things there. I think in a, one of the challenges for my leadership is the trust piece, right? So uh, yeah, how, how do I get trust and how do I also, and, and, but I also think trust works both ways, right? And so, and I think, you know, I'm, 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 I came in here with the mentality of that we're a, a unified school district and trying to uh, work in that realm. And I think there are some folks across the system and it's, it's not, I'm not pointing finger, it's not a blame game or anything like that at all. I just think that, uh, you know, some folks are operating in the older model that isn't here anymore, but it's still in our minds and maybe in some people's hearts. It's a, you know, it's a pretty seismic shift as we're all hearing from board members of all different tenures tonight. And, and so people make those adjustments in their own time, right? And, and that's just part of the reality. Nick, you're muted. You know, I, I it's, it's been a really terrific discussion, um, obviously starting out with what Scott said, but I think what everybody has said <clears throat> is extremely important because it's not about everybody agreeing, it's about knowing where we're starting. And Susan, I think you've done a great job at facilitating that. And leading into the, the second part of this conversation, um, I, I think one of the ongoing issues for the board is going to be really getting into specifics about what does a high quality education for each student look like? 
meaning what do you expect students to know and be able to do when they leave the when they leave each level of schooling, elementary, middle, and high, and what do you expect them to be able to do once they leave the system? Uh, because it's you know in other states, for example, I have frequently heard community college people say, "Well, these kids don't know how to write." Well, do we think that's important? Uh, do we think that the skill level is important? Susan, when I was listening to what you were saying, I have two daughters who are in science and engineering, and I know they weren't exactly encouraged to pursue those areas. So I think an issue is to what extent are we opening up those options for people? But I think the issue that Brian was just talking about and that several other board members alluded to is do, does there need to be a conversation over time about one, what trust looks like in practice when you actually trust each other? And if you feel there's been a breach of it, how do you address that? How do you talk it through? Who gets involved? What kind of resolution do you try to come to? The second is, you know, which I think is extremely important. What does safety look like? You know, in this era of increased awareness of the impact of bullying, in this era of increased awareness of the impact of discrimination and of people not exactly having great feelings towards one another, um, the you can use the, the abstraction of safety, but until you talk about what safety looks like in the hallways, in the classroom, when kids are out on the playground or they're, they're at a game, it's, it stays a very general thing. And the third piece is accountability. Accountability is has for some people become kind of like, you've got measles. And one of the important issues to talk about is for this board, what does accountability look like? For whom and at what levels? Um, you know, people have kind of test phobia. They think the only kind of accountability is, well, it's how you do on a test. Well, it's a lot more than that. And as we move into the second part of this conversation, I think each of those issues needs to be considered as we're talking about the goals of the district. And what I'd like to, to encourage the board to think about is if you achieve a goal, what difference does it make to you? What difference does it make to the school district? And to what extent are your goals leading to a place where you think they're useful? What I'd like to suggest is given that everybody has been sitting now for close to an hour and a half, that perhaps we take about a 10 minute break and then come back at about um, 20 minutes of eight. Does that work? Yes, yeah. Okay. So we'll, we will break for 10 minutes and then when we come back, let's start talking about goals, you know, and to what extent are the goals that uh, the board has identified before still feel useful or how, where do we want to move forward on it. But Susan, I, I think you've done an outstanding job of framing the issues. And I think that's really important. Well, I just want to thank the board for having me. Um, I'm going to tool off now. Um, enjoy your 10 minute break. And as I hope you all know, um, if you've got anything further that you want to ask or talk to me about or questions or anything, please don't hesitate to get involved. Just give me a call, shoot me an email. I'm easy to find. Thank you. Thank Susan, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks, Susan. Susan. Unless they need time and still allow for some public comments. Sure. Uh, I, I'd like you, if you would, to take a look at the um, board goals <clears throat> that were defined back in August of, uh, of perhaps earlier than that, of 2020. And does everybody have those? Yeah. Okay. I'd like to pose um, a couple of questions for you to think about and then I'd like to go around to each board member and see 
what your thoughts are about keeping the current goals or refining them or whatever you're comfortable talk, uh, dealing with. And the couple of questions I'd like to ask you to frame the conversation in um, are these. If you accomplish what you set out to do in the goal, what's it going to look like? Particularly, what will success look like? For example, there's a difference between saying that your goal is to have a meeting based or saying that the outcome of the meeting that you want is, for example, to agree on what level of literacy all students should have in the school district, which as I remember was an issue that Stephen talked about at the last retreat. Um, there, the second issue is what kind of data or information points do you want to use as a board? What's going to tell you that you're making progress? Is it, for example, um, having a meeting? Is it doing a report? Or is it looking for specific progress in that meeting from time one to time two? Do you want scores to go up? Do you want certain kinds of learning activities to occur? And these are just examples. Do you want performance to be looked at? Um, I was intrigued by what Susan was saying earlier about expectations. To what extent, for example, in the schools across the district, is there a core of expectations that you think every student should meet? And just to take one example and not to be exclusive about it, do you think every student should be able to write a whole sentence and understand that there needs to be a noun and a verb in it? with good punctuation and good spelling, no matter what your grade level is. Not saying that has to be something, but that's a very definable kind of goal. Do you think that students should be able to add, subtract, multiply, and divide? Um, and how do you wanna manage getting feedback on that process from Brian and through Brian, the staff about what kind of progress you're making in the district. So what I'd like to do is again, go around um, and I'm gonna be picking based on where your pictures are showing up here um, and just ask you to identify what you think the most important goals are. Meaning, do you just think you need to stick with what you have? Do you think you need to clarify and modify and understand that this is not a one act drama. You're gonna be continuously looking at your goals and looking at whether you feel they're really helping to get you where you wanna go, which is, I heard several people, you know, kind of responding positively to the idea of a high quality education. Well, what does a high quality education look like in the Washington district, in the Washington Central district? So why don't I start out with Dorothy? Can you kind of share with us Nick, your- I, Nick, could I interrupt you for a minute? Just, yes. be, sorry, just in our conversation, like could, could we go goal by goal just to see if the board members wanna keep it instead of putting them all together? You mean you want each board member to respond to whether they wanna keep that goal? Yes, because we at the end ended up with just two last year. We moved, so we had board governance and, and student achievement. Okay. So that it would allow us so to you, have a much richer conversation in, in one of them. And we were worried that we want to have an outcome at the end of this meeting. We talked about that. So it would allow us to, if we don't achieve both, then we'd at least have one that we have to find. Okay. So that you're you, if I'm hearing you correctly, you're asking each board member to respond to whether they want to keep those two goals? It, yes, yeah, but let's start with each individual goal. So let's, I think like if we ask them if the board governance goal is still good, let's just concentrate on that one goal right now and go around and then we'll go into the, so, because each one is, it's a little bit different and- Sure, yeah, absolutely. Okay? 
Yes, Dorothy? you can pick which ones you want to start, but I think, you know, four governors might be a little bit easier and then um, it will stay in line with board roles and responsibilities and thank you. Okay, so I, so are you reframing, reframing the question now to say, do I want to keep the board governance goal? Yes. Yes, I do. Um, I think that, I think that a lot of board members um, were very supportive of Act 46 from the beginning. Uh, and for your information, I was not, I actually was one of the plaintiffs. Um, because they looked at the Act 46 goals, they did not look at, at the uh, fine print. And I think they really don't have, as I tried to talk earlier about the fact that we don't just represent one town, we represent five towns. Uh -huh. um, I think they also don't truly understand that when we're looking at staff and especially the non the non classroom staff, the um, interventionists and coaches and so forth can now be more easily distributed where they're needed <coughs> in the five, five towns in the high school, rather than each, each school having their own um, interventionists, coaches, whatever, and that if they get moved because the students that were needing that are no longer there or have quote unquote graduated, if those non-classroom teachers get moved to another building, they somehow feel like they've been shorted, that they have lost something that they already had. Huh? And I think that's something that we need to really work hard in um, always thinking of that it's the five towns that when you work for Washington Central, you work for Washington Central, you do not have a contract with Callis or Romney or Doty or any of them. Uh -huh. You may be stationed there, but any good leader knows that it, to, the, to the best of their ability to keep a well-functioning group of say classroom teachers or even interventionists and coaches that the principal knows that they're functioning well and doesn't really want to break it up, but there are times when they may have to, for instance, I really don't know how it's going to sugar off, but Callis um, had a classroom teacher retire. I don't think they're going to replace that classroom teacher um, because our numbers have shrunk in Callis. Uh -huh. But if they were to, it could be that another school has shrunk enough so that they would have an extra classroom teacher and would send him or to Callis if Callis had the numbers. I'm just saying we need to be more flexible in where the staff work and give Brian more trust in those decisions. Very helpful. Diane? So definitely within the board governance, we've been making progress toward it. Um, and I think in order to model that we don't jump from initiative to initiative until we've completed it successfully, it makes sense to stick to that. And to me, what it would look like if I know that we're successful is that basically we understand what those roles are. We're able to give that elevator talk about um, what it means, all of those different um, parts of it, what my role is, what my duties are, and, and that. So that's how I would know um, if I've achieved success in that area. Great. Christina?
I, um, I, I agree that uh, with what Diane said, um, I'm just looking now. I don't, I don't have a copy. I don't think of the goals. Um, I was just looking to see if I could find them. So I don't know if somebody could send them to me. Do you have the Real agenda, Missy? Because if you have the agenda, if you scroll all the way down, there is it the very last page? I think it's the last. It's well, they're okay. they're in there. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I do see them. Okay. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Christina, are you comfortable with? board governance or governance in general being a priority? I am, yes. Great. Any other comments you'd want to make about that? Um, no, I, no, nope, not really. <laughs> okay. Lindy? I, I think I'm comfortable with those. With governance? Yep. Okay, Vera. I am comfortable with board governance. Okay, Scott. I'm fine with board building board governance. Um, I tend to think that the way to build board governance is by actually governing as a board. Uh -huh. um, so I, I would be okay with building in actual substantive sub goals in, in that. Um, and especially if they can be uh, aligned or, or um, at least consistent with what we set for Brian as his goals. Okay. Do you think there maybe needs to be a subgroup of the board that comes up with some proposals for the larger board to consider around that? Uh, I'm open to that for sure, yeah. Okay. I'm not trying to dictate, I'm just trying to propose a, a way for accomplishing what you're talking about. Okay, Caroline. I agree with the board governance goal remaining as a goal. Okay, you have any particular thoughts about things that may need to be addressed under that heading? No, but thank you. Okay. All right. Kari? Governance. We're not hearing you, Kari. How about that? Are you hearing me now? Much better. Okay, thank you. Um, I definitely think that governance should remain a top priority and we should set goals around it. And specifically, I think that we should be developing systems um, around key functions. And I'll list the ones that come to mind for me. Recruitment, we have a problem with recruiting new board members. An orientation system, not, not super difficult, but, but very important. Um, a board calendar which I, I think Floor ha and others have in mind. Um, so that, I think that's good. Um, that would include uh, a system of reporting throughout the year. And that uh, reporting would include some of the student achievement. So there's an overlap there, um, but also finance and other key functions that we as a board need to hear how things are going in order to fill up, fulfill our accountabil accountability function. Um, and related to that, a su superintendent evaluation. I think that we did a, uh, give us a what? W what do you think? A B minus, C plus, something like that for our, our work there. Um, we definitely have room for improvement. And um, that is something that ought to be um, systematized and written down and perpetuated uh, so that Brian knows what to expect. Um, and the last one, and this could be, we could, maybe carve this off as a separate goal, um, but something around communication and community engagement and the idea of how are we communicating with the community? How are, how do um, folks like who are on this meeting, how, how, what can they expect in terms of communicating with us? 
we might consider that part of governance. Maybe it's too big and needs to be its own its own system, uh, own goal. But um, to answer your question about what difference does this make, in my mind, this is about meeting our responsibilities that we just talked about. What are, what are the things that the board is responsible for? And but also by systematizing it, setting up future boards. So always an eye at what, about the next year's board and the year after that, so that they can build on our success. Very good. I'll stop. Jill. Oh, I'm so happy I get to go after Kari because I loved everything he said, um, and I want to, I guess, emphasize the communication piece. I think that's the thing we need to add to this goal. So I'm a yes on keeping a, a governance goal, but I do feel like we need to uh, go to the sub goals, as Scott was saying, and, and really do some refinement. Um, so that that would be, and I, I like the idea of a subcommittee that you suggested. I, I actually think that's the only way. Um, it's it's pretty hard when we're not in person to do the kind of exercises you have to do to do the brainstorming. So I would support that. Yeah, and, and in that vein, if I could suggest to you, uh, one of the most challenging areas for any board, frankly, for any organization, is to define what communication looks like. And for example, when you have differences of opinion, how do you address them? It's not that everybody's always going to agree or should agree. It's how do you deal with it when you're trying to be a part of a governing group? But I think you're raising outstanding points there. Stephen. Um, so I, I'm more harsh than Kari was on our performance. I would say we did not in, in reality make this a goal. I think this was an aspiration. Okay. Um, and we didn't set clear expectations of what we wanted. And uh -huh. where we did set clear expectations of what we wanted, we failed to do that. How so if we, want to, if we want to keep this as a goal, we need to hold ourselves accountable. How would you do that, Stephen? One, we would have to agree as a group that it is a priority. And, and as Kari listed several areas, I, I, I'll use the superintendent evaluation as and that's one of the that was the number one thing uh sub goal in the board governance goal and um as a board i'll be frank we didn't care about it shuffled it off to two or three people to come up with some kind of solution and we would talk about it at some board meetings, but I don't feel like we made it a priority. We spent time doing other things. We have a finite amount of time. If we've got goals and they're a priority, we make time for what our goals are and we, we don't have time to do other things. We need to manage our time more effectively. Coming back to what you're talking about in terms of, are you referring to the superintendent's evaluation? Correct. Okay. Something you may want to consider is to say, as a part of that evaluation process, who is responsible for what? What is the superintendent's responsibility in a particular area? What is a principal's responsibility? What is a teacher's responsibility? What is a student's responsibility? Um, and just to give you an example, frequently if people have people ask me about, um, well, who's accountable in a student testing situation? Something many people don't like to talk about. And my notion is the students are the one who takes the test, but ultimately as educators, we're responsible at different levels for making sure that the student's been exposed to what they need to be exposed to, engaging whether they've acquired that skills and not that set or those sets of skills and knowledge. So it may be important in terms of fine tuning what you're asking for to be able to define those things. I don't think we're at the point of fine tuning yet. Okay, that's fine. We're, we, we haven't mastered the gross um, general requirements. We're not at the stage where we can fine tune. It may be helpful over time just to kind of 
if you can come up with some clarification from for the board about your perceptions of what that fine tuning might look like, that might be very helpful. Jonas. Um, so my recollection about these goals is that we intentionally tried to keep them limited to things that we thought that we could actually accomplish. Okay. Uh, and I think Stephen Stephen's right that you know we have a you know a, a mixed track record uh, to be generous. Um, I you know I have some disjointed thoughts here. You know I also you know I'll, I'll pick and choose from from what people said. Um, you know I agree with Kari about um, uh, you know a communicating you know a goal around communications um, you know inside the the district organization and in the larger community. Um, you know, Scott said a lot of things that I agree with um, that, you know, particularly that the best way to, uh, you know, govern better is to govern, um, you know, a lot of this is, you know, comes from practice and repetition. Um, but over the last two years, we've gotten sidetracked and sidelined so often, uh, and by so many different things um, that, you know, I, you know, personally, I have to grade us on a curve. Um, um, you know, I, you know, I, I would be more charitable than, uh, than, than Stephen a, a, a little bit, you know, I would also note that there's, you know, you know, when Kari talks about, um, you know, uh, you know, more subgroups, right. And more working groups, um, you know, the, the list of things that we want to accomplish gets longer and longer. And I know that there's a tension between, you know, wanting to, um, you know, to really formalize and professionalize the, you know, the systems that we use. There's tension between that and the, you know, the, you know, the, the more folksy model that I think people in, in, in Vermont are, are, are used to. Um, and, you know, I think we also need, you know, as we have trouble about, you know, with, uh, uh, with recruitment, you know, I also think that we, you know, at some point we're going to have trouble with retention. Um, and we kind of have already, we've lost some, you know, good people who just couldn't do it anymore. Um, you know, the, the lift is getting bigger and the ask is getting larger. And I think that that's something that we just have to keep in mind. Okay. Chris. Chris McVeigh. I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, I think we should keep the governance goal and uh, have a subgroup to work on it. Specifically, we spent about a year or more reading this book by Patrick, Patrick Rice. And I think we should come to a conclusion as a board whether or not we want to engage that book anymore and take parts out of it to uh, employ it as a governance model or just be done with it um, because we engaged not only the board as a whole but staff members uh, going through that book on a I guess at least every other board meeting uh, time and, and it seems like we spend a lot of time on it and we should either engage it or not um, but I think we should come up with a governance model that um, is different or, or tweak what we have now but it'd be just to be deliberate about it. Okay. Floor. Yeah, I, I, I agree with what Harry said and what many of you have said. I, 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 I think we have to create a... Chris, are you done? Uh, that, that we... We need to create that structure and systems so that it doesn't matter if we are around five years from now or who the superintendent is. So creating that that culture is, is really important for me and the systems. So I want to keep the board governance. I can I can pledge to have the, the second part. We have uh, that goal. We were able to put some, uh, some, some goals. So it, Thanks to Jill, we have board norms and we're not necessarily developed by November 18, but we got board norms. I, I would pledge to create the board roles description after our meeting uh, with collaboration with 
with others, but uh, do it by the end of May. But I think this is one of the most important things we do and how to achieve it for me is getting that long-term uh, planning and includes a calendar, right? So that, so that we can stay on task and know what's coming, know when we're expecting reports, just it's not a calendar that will every single detail, but it will keep us uh, focused. And I agree with what Jonas was saying. I, I don't want people to feel overwhelmed. You know, we're already over task in, um, you know, the idea of having one board meeting uh, a month was to allow us to maybe do some of this work time of the month. So, so I'm hoping that we can create, uh, to meet three things, the board calendar, uh, a system of reporting, like Carrie was saying, and more, you know, for, for quality education, but a system of reading, a clear communication uh, between superintendent and, and, and board and that we want the good, the bad, and you know, we want full transparency. And, and last, uh, I, I think I already said long-term planning and you asked what difference uh, would this make or at the beginning, we, it won't matter who's in the board if we create the systems, you know, we, we would be setting the, the district for success in years to come. And, and the last thing would be, uh, as we create those goals or do that board goal, that if we give responsibility to a committee, because I agree with everybody, we had a minus C on superintendent evaluation. Uh, and here with the chart, we have a clear charge, make sure that they have the resources they need. And by a charge, I don't mean a formal charge, but expectation and the resources they need. And hopefully you could hear me. Yes. Okay. The next go around is going to be about, do you still want to keep the uh, student achievement goal? And what do you think that looks like for you? Uh, I'm not looking for you to share everybody else. I mean, you know, I'm not looking for a shared opinion here, but just what you perceive that student achievement goal to look like for you. Um, and how will that frame for you that goal making a difference? Dorothy? You're on mute, Dorothy. I would keep that goal. I, I would like to find a way to maybe focus it more. Um, since we're going through this um, this audit of our of what we teach, uh -huh. that um, we need to take the information that we get from that and see how it will fit into our goal for improving student achievement. Okay. Diane? So I, I think we're, we're working toward it. And again, um, with ed quality, we've talked about how right now we're kind of skimming the top as we're getting familiar with what the tools look like. Um, but we're beginning to build that system of how do we dig deep into what it's telling us. Um, and as we're working through it, it's that building that plane as you're flying it, um, you know, we're identifying who are the missing voices. And so I think it's, it's critical because that's what we're responsible for is to be sure that all learners have access and ability to learn. So unless we're analyzing it. Um, and so and then also making the move to one board meeting a month is my hope that that allowing extra time then for us to spend more than an hour um, a month looking at the ed quality and the different parts that we do. Okay, Christina. Um, yeah, I think it's a goal that we should keep. Um, and I would, I would like to see if the board could move towards spending more time um, each month working towards that goal and working towards it as a goal of a whole district instead of the individual schools um, to kind of get everybody on the same page. Okay, Lindy. I, I have no problem with these two goals. 
I would like for the number two, where we're improving learning for all students, to have more discussion or input from the leadership team at our meetings. So they quite often attend, but we don't hear from them. And just to get their input on how it's looking at the various schools, um, I don't know. I just think I think that would be valuable for us. Okay, Vera. Um, I I need some clarification because um, so my term ended in March of 2020, and I was just um, elected as of March as a write-in of 2021. So, right. um, so establish a board process for review and analysis of student achievement of our student learning outcomes. What is the status of that goal right now? Can anybody answer that question? I can take a step at that. This is, this is Kari. Um, so we, over the past year, have been um, looking at each one of the student learning outcomes, um, one per month and um, using uh, information from our director of curriculum, um, trying to get a better understanding of what are the expectations, the standards, what are, what are um, some insights into our curriculum and our instruction, and then what is the achievement data look like? And then having discussion about, about you know, okay, what do we think about that? What questions do we have? Um, what are the implications and so on? And we've, and we're, about two thirds of the way through the outcomes at this point, and um, um, but that's my that that's my description of the system that we've developed. And one building on what on what Kari was saying, one issue to look at over time is whether you believe, as a board, that the outcomes you're looking at are worthwhile. Meaning, are you focusing in the right places? Are there things you need to be considering in addition that you may not be looking at yet? Scott? So the process is- I'm sorry, Vera? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so the process right now is reporting out to the board a different, um, I'm gonna say subject area monthly. Uh-huh. Um, it would be not, I guess for my, I, I agree with the two goals that are here. I guess for my, um, to hold us accountable to make sure that we're doing something with these goals is to have a living document of the status of the monthly um, analysis and reviews. So under our goal here, each month we would somebody would be assigned to type in there what was analyzed, what was reported out, and where we're at as a district, whether it be math, science, whatever subject area it might be. So then like for me, the coming in and for other, any other new board members, we would know kind of what has happened over the last, well, since 1021 of 2020 when this was approved. Uh -huh. Other than that, I agree with the two goals, but I, I think there needs to be more depth to this. I mean, we're all okay. here for student out for student achievement and me looking at this I can't tell you where we're at right now so that's hard not knowing that the, there's any subcategories underneath one and two as to where we're at and what has been reported out there is something you may want to consider doing um, in, I'm sure you've got plenty on your plate is kind of laying out a, a, a draft if you will of what that specificity would look like to be helpful to you and then sharing it with the board. Okay, sure. Just, you know, um, it, this is not homework that you have to do by X date, but I think it just would help to clarify for other board members what your thinking is. Sure, I can do that. Great, Scott? Thanks. Um, based on that conversation just now between Vera and Kari, I might just suggest, um, because uh, I think a board process has actually been established through Kari's committee, the Education and Quality Committee, to um, uh, just as Vera was sort of looking for, um, using that process to show um, 
on a broad range of indicators, are things getting better or are they getting worse? And where and why, <clears throat> if, we can, if we can say that, um, as a way of deepening what Vera was just talking about, the um, making more meaningful that part one. And part two, I think um, that is uh, well on track is my understanding. Um, we're, we're aimed in that direction and we're going forward. Okay, Carolyn. Thanks. So I agree that we definitely keep the student achievement goal. I feel like the specifics underneath, I feel like they need to be tweaked. I'm just not sure how I would tweak them. I don't want to lose what's there. But for example, um, when we hear about the content areas each month, I'm always left wanting more. And it's like we just get this, this little piece, like, like we had this amazing presentation, I think it was in March on math. It, it was fantastic. But then I wanted to follow up with it and, and, and you know have more questions and get a little more specific and it's just not possible. So I don't know if, I don't know if having fewer content areas so we can go deeper or I don't, I don't necessarily know what I want. I just feel like it's been tricky to feel like we are deep enough that we can actually analyze the student achievement on our student learning outcomes or you know in some of the presentations we've heard that we know it's an area where where we really need to grow and so then and, and maybe it's not appropriate for our role as a board but sometimes it's like I really want to know a couple months down the road after that so what is being done right now what can we expect um, as opposed to waiting until next March to hear again about math. Um, so I'm not sure if that totally makes sense because I don't feel like I have an answer to what I want. I just feel like, I don't know. I feel like it's, it's not perfect yet, if that makes sense. Um, Caroline, if I'm yeah. hearing you correctly, would it be helpful to you if for a particular subject that you wanted more clarification on? And I'm not trying to say this specific time, but you propose, let's say, a 45 minute meeting one morning over coffee where you talked about that subject only for board members who are interested in coming. And you didn't talk about anything else because I think sometimes given all the responsibilities that the board has, a board meeting can become a challenge for addressing a lot of specifics in the areas you're concerned about. Well, I would always love to talk about math over coffee for 45 minutes. So I, okay. would, say, I would say yes to that. But yeah, and I think then, and you know, and there's also something about just an opportunity for the board members who are interested in it, having that time and access to, um, yeah, to the conversation, to have it a little less formal, but still part right. of our role, I, I think yep. that would be, I think it would be great if it was appropriate and if all board members agreed it, it is appropriate and leading us toward the goal of analysis of student achievement on the student learning outcomes. So, great. yeah. Jill. Um, so we certainly still need this goal. Um, I, I guess as a member of the Education Quality Committee, one of the things that um, I think we've been talking about is not just looking at our performance, but asking ourselves, and what do we do about the performance? So I think that's what others are, are pro probably getting at. And the piece that I still feel like I don't know how to get my arms around is where the curriculum audit work fits into this goal. I think it does, and that perhaps some of the specificity and sort of squishiness that people are describing, those dots may get connected with that. I guess I would defer to Brian on that. Um, but that's, that's what I was hoping, that that, that, that process is going to help us deepen this and turn it into the, you know, more of the strategic plan that's described. If I could suggest, 
something you can consider, Jill, it would be that sometimes it's helpful to what take what people normally define as curriculum and think of it in three parts. One is, what are you teaching? The second is, how are you teaching it? And the third is, what kind of results are you getting from it? To see if the first two, the what and the how, are leading to the kind of results that you really want. That's one way of doing it. Yeah, that's really helpful way to think about it. Thank you. Okay, Stephen? Um, it definitely needs to stay as a goal. I think the Ed Quality Committee has done an exceptionally good job on establishing review and analysis uh, of student performance and uh, having that information posted. Um, I think this goal is an area where we as a board do not do not function as we're supposed to. So the great review and analysis that's done by the Ed Quality Committee has no context. So what? What, would you, what right? would you like that context to look like? I think that the board responsibility is overall and visionary. And I, I, I'm not suggesting where it should be anywhere, but for example, we want to see uh, um, our proficient the proficiency level of our students in math outcomes as measured by whatever we want to measure it by um, are 70 percent and we're currently at 50 percent so then when there's a review and analysis of where we're at and how we're doing it has context right it's nice if everyone feels good about it it's nice if this review and analysis is presented to the board and thank you leadership team and, and thank you teachers for assembling this information. That's all nice, but is it getting us to our goals? And we currently don't have any goals, none. We have if, no student achievement goals. If I could suggest you consider something, I'm sorry, I didn't want to interrupt you. Um, sometimes it's helpful to look a couple of years out like four or five years out and ask students who've gone to college or community college or Votech school, given what you accomplished while you were here in our district, what did you learn that was helpful and what do you wish you would learn? Which I think can sometimes help frame what kinds of achievement goals you want. That's one way of doing it. Well, I, I would say there's a million ways of doing it and there's a million potential goals we right. just haven't set any of them and we haven't set any way to measure them. Okay. Jonas? Uh, we definitely need, uh, a, you know, student achievement goals. Um, you know, I haven't been able to pay as much uh, you know, attention or attend any of the Ed Quality Committee meetings. Um, um, I also, you know, I... I hear what Stephen is saying, right? That statistics are only valuable if you know, you know, if you can really see what the change is over time and, and you can, you know, you know, normalize it um, in some ways. I think that's, you know, really, really hard to do. Um, um, you know, I think our goal should be, you know, can, you know, Im improvement. Um, you know, and I, I think the Ed Quality Committee is doing a good job. Of, uh, I hope they're doing a good job of figuring out how to measure that. Um, I think that when the curriculum management review uh, is delivered to us, I think that that has to be an opportunity for us to work with the superintendent to, uh, you know, first of all, for us to learn, you know, how he intends to use that information to make changes and we need to be able to, you know, we need to be in a place where we can measure the effects of, of those changes. I think that, you know, I get the sense that, that you know, that there, um, that there are going to be a lot of conversations about this. And, you know, this is going to be another one of those inflection points of sort of, you know, before and, and after. So I think that our goal should be, um, you know, we should be looking toward, you know, making sure that we're prepared for that after. Okay. Christopher? 
Um, hi there. Um, we should definitely keep this as a goal. And since, um, so Nick, you you said uh, two different times that we should be um, searching out students um, and asking them what did they learn and what did they wish they had learned. And, and I think the first time you said you should, you should do when they're graduating high school. And, and then the second time, I think you said it, um, you said a few years out. So presumably either in college or into some type of other work environment. Yep. Um, so why wouldn't, why wouldn't we be doing that like at the end of every year? That's a great idea. And it also speaks to articulation across grade levels that sometimes we assume that teachers talk with each other across grade levels and sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. But setting up an articulation process where at the end of each year, teachers from, let's say, second grade talk to teachers in third grade and say, what did you expect kids to know and what did they know? And what did you and kind of promote that kind of articulation so that we really understand how kids what kids are learning and what we wish they had learned. And have you seen that? In, uh, in other districts? Where I they did do that in every other year? Districts. You did. I, you did. Yeah, I required it. Okay. Um, and so let me let me continue on. Is the um, the curriculum review audit that we are awaiting for? Um, I think Jonas is right. It's going to be an important point. Um, but what I also um, hope that we do is that we look back in time um, because I think we have had previous audits. Um, and I'm, think, I'm thinking particularly of our um, literary and literature, um, had a literary literature or audit. I don't know if we've ever had a math one and just see what came of those, what actions were taken, if any, in response to the audit and see if those reactions had a positive effect on student achievement or not uh, so that we don't uh, take the same reaction potentially to this audit if it if it generates one but it sounds like it would okay. thank you uh, no also kudos to the um, um, carriers committee they, they really do a very nice job in presenting a lot of information every board meeting thank Great. you Kari? Well, this has um, actually been really helpful. I really appreciate hearing all these comments. It gives me a lot of thoughts. I've been thinking about this and I haven't had a chance to talk with the committee yet. We're planning to do a review of the past year, but here's, here's a few thoughts. Um, in the near term, what I'd like to do is have us finish up all of the student learning outcomes. So we, we've had spent some focus time, time on each one of them. And then two threads to the, what comes next. One is, is this idea of working with the information that we get from the curriculum management review. And then all of this is informing the strategic planning, right? And I don't know exactly what the planning process is gonna be. I'm not sure how, how the board is involved. Are we just one stakeholder or are we gonna be, um, you know, driving the bus. I'm, I'm not sure exactly how that's going to work, but um, the goal of having a strategic plan is that we have alignment on how we're going to, um, um, you know, do better in terms of student achievement over the next five years. And that uh, hopefully, uh, ultimately, will take the form of some kind of policy or target benchmark um, so we can get at what Stephen's talking about. We need to have a uh, um, you know, defined, uh, you know, measures of success, and then aim for that and keep and keep pushing in that direction. So that's one part of it. And the other part of it is what is our system for measuring success. And so I think we've been working on that by looking at the data over this next year. And I think we should continue, continue, we were talking earlier about how we're getting a little more proficient, we're getting more comfortable with some of the data that we've been seeing, because it's, um, you know, some repetition. So Ultimately, out of this, we want to have a good sense of what are our standards and what is the evidence that we use, and what is what do the reports look like. And there's a definitely should be a component where we're looking at equity amongst different students. And so this is this is our our way of um, 
understanding performance and achievement within the system. And I, and I also think, and then we have that as part of a, a calendar that we can count on over the year. And so part of that is updates on instruction and curriculum as well, some of the content, not just the outcomes. And the difference that this makes, I think this is really about making student achievement central to the board's work. I really want, I'd like to see that be a focus of almost every meeting if possible. And, you know, because it's all about our mission to, to, to uh, serve our students. Very important points. One thing you may want to consider over time is who are you talking to when you're reporting on data and who do you want to understand? And I'm not looking for an answer, but it's an ongoing issue uh, in many school districts that there are these phenomenal presentations of data that come out. And then sometimes people say at the end of the meeting, what was that all about? So one of the issues is to take some target groups and say, what would you like to know about how kids are doing and how would you like to know it? Meaning what kind of language do we need to use to convey to people what kids are learning and where we want them to improve and where they're doing very well. Um, it's just something to consider. Let's do a quick go around here uh, because I know that uh, Floor wants to take some time toward the end for the public comment period. And I'd like each of you, and I'm gonna pick where we start, to tell me in only one or two sentences what you've learned in this session. Scott, why don't you start? Come on, one or two sentences? Only one or Not two. Fair. You can write an essay afterwards sentences. and submit it. <laughs> um, can, uh, can I interrupt you guys, Nick? Do, do I get a chance to go for I'm very the, sorry. Uh, I apologize, Scott. <laughs> I'm going to have to defer to the chair. Well done, I Scott. Just, go ahead, Floor. Yeah, I just wanted to have a chance to go to the <laughs> student learning outcomes. Yes, I, I support that, uh, that goal. And I agree with what has been said that we need to uh, be more specific. Uh, and we were talking about setting goals for improvement that we have done in the past in math or in literacy so that we can truly analyze that. I also, I'm, I'm always curious. We, uh, I think measuring achievement is super important, but I also think as our duty to also uh, monitor, uh, our, how do we measure our creating, but are we fostering lifelong learners? Uh, how do we measure that our kids are engaged high and and the comment that was made about how are they doing four years past graduation right we we don't have a way to collect that data and i think that that is super important and how do we ensure equity across uh, our schools should be me the biggest umbrella over arching umbrella on this uh, on this uh, on this goal equity across and then last, the strategic plan is probably going to be, to me, the most important thing that we're going to do. Uh, you know, we're going to do this monitoring, which we're not very good at yet, but we're working towards it, uh, parallel to doing the strategic plan. And we're not doing the strategic plan, but we're part of the strategic plan. Uh, and that's going to be the roadmap or highway for the next five, uh, five years with combination of the curriculum assessment data that we're going to get. So how do we involve the community is gonna be crucial in that strategic plan to make sure that we're reflecting the values of our community and what they wanna see as what we used to call the portrait of a graduate. It, it, so, and why would this make a difference is because it would just to say what Chris was saying, that it, it would bring equity from the board to the classroom. And I think that that's why it's important. So that Scott, you get hold it before Scott goes. One way you can uh, too often, I think the reason that strategic plans end up gathering dust and not a whole lot more is that we don't go out on a regular basis, maybe annually, and ask, let's say, focus groups in different parts of the community, what do you think this is about? What do you think this specific goal or activity is about? 
And what, what does it mean to you? Do, you? do you think we should keep doing it? The way um, a strategic plan continues to take on meaning or in some people use the term remains organic is when you ask people what they think and what their understanding is of what you're trying to do. So that's something you could consider as a part of the strategic planning process. Scott? Thanks. Um, I appreciate the chance to collect my thoughts. Um, it, it sometimes seems to me that as a board, we're like a fussy old man who drives his car with one foot on the accelerator and the other foot on the brake at the same time <laughs> and um, worries that the, the help is trying to pull a fast one on us and um, generally tends to look at the world with a bit of a sour um, attitude. Whereas in fact, in many ways, things are, are going pretty well. There are problems, but we seem to, we, we recognize them and are, are doing a lot of things right, it seems to me. So I'm trying to focus on those times when we've really been at our most effective as a board and, and do that more. Good. Caroline, what have you learned from this session? I was not expecting to go so soon. Um, but <laughs> I've learned that we actually have a lot of similarities in our beliefs. Um, hearing from, from everyone, I would say more similarities in our beliefs than I expected. And I think we are in agreement about the what, and it's more the how that we need to have more discussion about and likely we'll need to come to a compromise. Okay, that's well said. Jill? Um, I, uh, you know, at our in-person retreat, I actually said that I heard a lot of um, consensus and that I thought we were largely on the same page. And I, I would say I feel even more so that way um, listening to this conversation. I think Caroline's point about how we've got some differences in the how is right. Um, but I, I think that's pretty surmountable, actually, because we have a lot of um, such so much shared goal. Terrific. Stephen? Oh, I, I would say I've learned that I continue to be an outlier in my thoughts among the board members. <laughs> but you get people to think, Stephen. There you go. Jonas. Um, what have I learned? Um, I've learned that, that Scott, Scott is very good with an analogy. Um, I, I would push back a little um, against uh, Scott's characterization um, of, of us as the fussy old man who thinks that the help is trying to pull one over on us. You know, I think that we've, <laughs> we, we, I think we have generally been remarkably deferential and, and we have tried to be disciplined in the way that we, you know, that we interact with, you know, other people and other things sort of outside of the of the board. And when we have not done that, there has been reflection and, you know, attempts to, uh, you know, uh, you know, to moderate that, um, you know, th th there is a lot of consensus on the board. Um, um, but I think quite, quite often, um, I think we temper ourselves and I think that the essential, uh, you know, fault lines, you know, on whatever it may be, uh, you know, often remain hidden and in, in, in deep underground. Christopher? Um, I think there is a, uh, a hunger for measurable specifics in what we do. I think we, we're looking for measures that we can say this is achieved or that was achieved, and if not, why not? Okay. Kari? I agree. There seems to be um, um, pretty good alignment um, about the things that we should be focused on. 
And I think that um, we're set up pretty well if we can do at least two things. One is define these a little more specifically, um, what these goals are, what, what success looks like, and then two, have the discipline to stay focused on them throughout the year when we have so many other responsibilities and there are so many unknowns that are gonna come our way. Can we uh, continue to come back to these? If, if so, I think the next year or two could be really impactful as a board. I think the challenge always is there's, there's always new things that come up. And part of the challenge is sorting out what's really important to you as you move forward. And that's not something for which there's only a one-time answer, but it's a constant challenge for any organization and in particular school districts. Christina. Um, I've learned that the goal of student achievement um, is really deep and has a lot of different complex parts um, and can look a little bit different to everybody, but that, um, you know, I think we all have the same end goal. Um, we all want to see what's best for our district. And so I look forward to working together to obtain these goals. Diane. So it, I learned it was helpful to be reminded of what those goals were and the fact that the work we've been doing is, is you know, slogging forward to do it. It reminds me of mud season and we're really stuck in the muck right now. And then, you know, we're going to hit some dry patches where we'll catch some traction and get going. Um, but then we have to expect we'll get slogged down again. And we're right. As we're digging deeper, we need to identify what those things are that are measurable so that then we know, are we on the same page or not as to what, when we're using the same words. So um, it was helpful to review it. And I almost wonder if those should be put below our norms so that it's a constant reminder of what we said we're working on. Um, so thanks for this opportunity to review. Dorothy? Um, well, I learned that most of us want to stay with the original goals, but fine tune them a little bit. Um, many people some, made some good comments about how we should go about doing that. And um, I think there will be a, a positive outcome with some of those ideas. Great. Vera? So um, ditto to what Diane said, I, the only thing I would add is um, a little deeper because of the longevity that I've had on the board. Um, I, we definitely get stuck in the mud when we talk about goals yearly. Um, I do agree that adding them to the norms page would be a great idea and doing um, a mid-year check-in, which maybe that was done last year, I'm not sure but it would be nice to have a, a mid-year check in on the status of where we're at with the goals. Great, Lindy. Um, I learned that the goals are still, uh, we value them still, but we want more specificity for measuring or checking in with them. Do you feel you can make a contribution in giving input to the quality committee around what you're looking for? I hope so, because I'm on the committee. <laughs> this is a good thing. <laughs> Floor? So I, yeah, well, first of all, I, I guess I, I want to say that I appreciate all of the comments that it was valuable to have the revision of the struggle with that question. And we felt that it was important to, you know, revisit and not try to reinvent. And, and I was hoping to go even a little as far as instances I, I i think that i'm encouraged to see how much we have grown as a board a, and it hasn't been easy all the time but i think like a, they have a lot in in common and a lot to build on a, so i i i i, I truthfully i'm just excited to get a little deeper in and committed to doing that a, board calendar and and I think it's a great suggestion to add the goals to the, the forms so this is not the last retreat so we you know if this is the work that we value we have to come back to this uh, quickly <laughs> that's it okay floor 
I am now going to turn the meeting over to you because I know you wanted to have time for public comment. So, uh, and I appreciate everything that people have brought to the meeting because I think there's a really strong commitment here to try to come to a shared uh, perspective on what's important for kids and parents in this district, which in my view is fundamentally what schools, public schools are about. So floor, it's all yours. Thank you. And I wanna thank you, Nick, for facilitating and for, for, for working this, thing, this retreat to the board. Uh, thank you. Sure. So I wanna, I, I want to open it up. I know we have uh, members of the public here and teachers with us. It, we did not have a, a, a um, today, but I want to respect that we have a lot of people here. It, there won't be any comments from the board, but we want to hear from you. Please, if you could raise your hand and please forgive me if I don't see you all at the same time. And hopefully you can hear me clearly. I don't see any hands raised quite yet, so I see Roger now, and if there's anybody else that wants to speak. Um, so, uh, Roger. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to read the letter that um, the music teachers wrote this past week to the board so that everyone else and the people that are here um, can hear it. Um, I would really like to sing it, but I won't do that for you. I'll just read it. <laughs> um, uh, members of the WCUUSD School Board, this was written April 5th. We, the collective K-12 through Music Department of Washington Central, would like to ask you for clarification on the FTE cuts that our department has recently incurred. When the state of Vermont issued the Return to Learn guidelines last summer, it was very clear that the music department would be the hardest hit with curricular restrictions. We were being asked to deliver a comprehensive music education to all K-12 students without being able to sing, dance, or play instruments. Our elementary and middle level teachers were asked to translate it all to a cart, and our high school courses have been 100% virtual since. Regardless of the restrictions, we persevered to still provide for all of our students. Every year we face the harsh reality of part-time positions. Decades of budget cuts and under-supported elementary programs have left our department with a skeleton structure, requiring teachers to put in more of their personal time to ensure students still had the same experiences. Despite these decades of cuts, when the district found themselves without a music teacher in Callis mid-2019, Sam Mishkin stepped up to help out only to be cut back more in East Montpelier. This year, when our remote academy students were not given access to allied arts classes, it was the music department that stepped up to teach those students, all without taking the offer of compensation. Coming into this academic school year, tensions were higher than they've ever been. Our yearly worries of rifts seem to be staring at us through holes in our schedules. Through state mandated guidelines to keep students safe, we were stripped of our ability to teach band, instrumental lessons, and chorus. After many elementary music teachers approached their administrators with their respective worries, they were all told the same thing, that FTE would not be impacted this school year or in future school years because of gaps due to COVID. We finally could take a deep breath and focus on our work. With the recent rifts in FTE, our elementary program has suffered a cut of 0.7 FTE. Each time a cut is given to the program, it is communicated that there will not be a cut in programming but we don't know how this is possible. When asked, what are the must-haves at WCUUSD? What programs need to be supported? Parents responded that their top choice of programs to be supported were the arts. This comes from the superintendent's uh, recent mailing. This survey highlights a clear disc disconnect between what parents want to see for their children's learning experience and where resources are being allocated. It's time we start listening to our communities, our parents, our teachers, and most importantly, our students. They are begging for more arts, and yet we continue to cut them back. Here comes the time-sensitive question. What is going to give? With point five of cuts to our elementary music department happening just this year, and point seven happening over the last two years, what is being let go? 
Please do not let administrators show you schedules for this year with all of their required COVID gaps and assume that there is time being wasted. A cut this year is a cut to programming no matter how you spin it. And these cuts are being decided without open, transparent conversation with the music education team. Our K-12 program has a long way to go before it becomes what students deserve. Even before these cuts, we were underserving students with their access to general music, instrumental music, and choral music. Students need at least two opportunities within a week to receive instrumental instruction and one 30-minute small group lesson on their specific instrument. The cuts incurred this year no longer allow for a beginning instrumental program across all five of our elementary schools. If we cannot provide the bare minimum it takes to learn a beginning instrument, then we need to eliminate beginning instruction from all of our elementary schools and provide a consistent and acceptable start in seventh grade. However, starting instrumental instruction in the seventh grade is not what any of our music educators want to see. A start in seventh grade would mean that our program would be the latest starting program in the state and possibly in the country. Any student starting an instrument in seventh grade would be at a disadvantage of attending an all-state music festival, which we did have the joy of hosting two years ago, the New England Music Festival or beyond. Students would be behind when accessing musical expression with students beyond our school district, but if we cannot provide them a strong foundation, we are essentially strangling those opportunities from the bottom up. As members of the school community, we urge you to talk to your town members and ask them if they're okay with the elimination of an elementary, elementary instrumental music program. Despite some growing concerns and worry over FTE, we love it here. We love working with our students and their families. We love the communities we work for and the people we work with. We show up every day eager and willing to make a difference, but we need guidance from you, our school board. We are willing to do the work it takes to be the best program in the state, but we cannot do that work if we keep incurring the cuts. Thank you for your collective responses. Respectfully signed, the WCUUSD Collective K-12 Music Department, which includes Kate Liptak, Roger Grow, Ann Decker, Sam Mishkin, David Powelson, Michael Close, Alaria Doan, and Meta Bravos. Thank you very much for allowing us to read this and share our concerns and our thoughts about this. Thank you so much, Roger. Is there anybody else? Oh, I see Kate's hand up. Kate McKen. Are you there, Kate? Can everybody hear as my, yeah. Yeah, so, okay. So it's not like Kate can't hear me. So I don't know if she's there. It, Lynn? Okay. Yep. Hello, um, my name is Lynn Spencer and I'm the art teacher at Berlin Elementary School. I have been an art teacher for 28 years in central Vermont. For the last 15, I have been had the privilege to be the art teacher here at Berlin. And I've also been a voter in the town of Berlin uh, for the last 28 as well. So I have strong ties in this community. Uh, listening to the, um, the conversation that the board had earlier, it struck me that the, the one of the themes that uh, was consistent through the conversation was the idea of trust and communication. And so I wanted to share what a shock it was in just a little over a week ago that I was informed that cuts and changes would be happening in uh, the arts program at Berlin and that uh, my first reaction was the budget passed. How did this, why don't I know? And it was, um, it was disappointing to not have had an opportunity to have a clear discussion and conversation as a community member, as a staff member um, with um, all interested parties on what will happen, what would like to happen, um, how, what is going to be best for um, our students and our, and our overall learning community. 
with these changes, it's about time. Looking at an, uh, a schedule, formal schedule printed out, it is uh, on any teacher schedule. It, if it's printed and uh, listed, it sometimes uh, doesn't look as if it is full. Like it might appear that at the board, uh, the only time you are doing anything at the board is at a meeting. And you know that that is certainly not the case and neither is it the case um, for any teacher. I am very concerned that with these cuts, the changes will make turn yeses into nos for a student. And we know that the most successful, uh, one of the ways to success for students is that uh, strong content or contact with a caring adult. And I'm very concerned as this time is condensed that when a student comes into me, to my room and says, can I work on my project? No, I don't have time. When a student comes in to say, can we have lunch together? Because of what I will need to do, it will be, oh, I'd like to, but I don't have time. When a math teacher at the third grade said, my students are trying to um, really learn how to create a cube. Do you have time? I want to be able to say, you bet. Come on in. I have time in my schedule. Let's work together. When a first and second grade teachers are working on literacy, I have time in my schedule to say, yes, let's work together, team teach, and we can make these things happen. It's student contact time is not always what it appears on a formally printed schedule. I encourage the board to embrace that open communication as it has been historically in our community where we sit down, we talk about it, we listen respectfully, and that all interested parties have an opportunity to share what needs to be, uh, what they need to convey to um, administration and that um, that's all I have to say. So thank you for taking the time to listen. Thank you so much, Lynn, for your input. Uh, I don't see any other hands up. Uh, oh, Daniel. Uh, thank you. I know you all like cringe when you see my name come up for talking, so I'll, I'll be brief. Um, I, the, the letter that was written was uh, superb and covered a lot of the topics. Um, but I'd like to read a few more um, quotes from the release that came out to us with this beautiful print and the dashing man in the kilt on the back, I want to point out. Um, I'm going to read a few quotes here. Uh, our graduation rate, while steady over a number of years, dipped below the Vermont average. Our SAT math scores dipped below the Vermont state average. Our SAT critical reading scores dipped below the Vermont state average. Our enrollment numbers have been steady, have been in steady decline over the past four years. Our cost per pupil is the highest in Vermont at $19,408. Are we investing in the right areas to improve our students' educational and life outcomes? Uh, this is significant in the understanding that when you look at the growing body of knowledge in education, there is a clear correlation between music, music education, and academic success. There are high level colleges at this point requiring students to have musical studies, but yet somehow with our numbers, clear as they are, this was a choice made somewhere above. Uh, and I think when we look at the uh, questions that are being asked in the publications that we're producing, there is a disconnect and a dishonesty with our actions and our words. And so I would just like to, to motion to the board that we reconsider and truly seek success, which was one of the main conversation pieces I heard today at the board meeting. How do we find success? And how do we create community? I know few better systems to create community than music and arts. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. I you're back and you had up before. Yes, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, great. 
I'm Kate McCann, 2017 Vermont State Teacher of the Year and a teacher of mathematics at U32. First, I wanna say that I'm so proud of my colleagues for turning out and tuning in for tonight's meeting. We started the meeting with 50 participants and six voices have been silenced over the course of three hours. Thank you, Lindy, for continuing to push for public comments earlier in the evening than at the end. We've given all day and now an additional three hours. What Chris said early on resonated with me that licensed professionals are employees of the district and not the superintendent. My being here tonight is trifled. One, I stand with my colleagues in the music department that are enduring rifts after a community survey put the arts at highest priority. Two, in referring back to something Dorothy said earlier this evening, that relationship that smaller boards had with their building principles should not be lost as you move towards a governance model. The model incorporates ethics, integrity, and a responsible code of conduct for all leaders and workers in our learning community. At the moment, we have a rising level of mistrust as voices are being suppressed. Three, I would advocate for the full transparency that Floor highlighted just after 8 p.m. tonight. Stephen, educational goals are vital and I'm available if you'd welcome my input. A curriculum review in the middle of a pandemic isn't the answer. P.S. As a stats teacher, I appreciate the outlier. And Caroline, I'd love to talk math with you. You can find me at U32. Math over coffee, yes. Thank you, Kate. I'm trying to see if there's, oh, Allison. Uh, we would just like to um, share our support for the things that we've missed this last year in music. Eli, come back. Um, our students really, really enjoy the music that they have in Berlin. And they're looking forward to getting back to that. And that would be a very big shame if that was not possible. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. Thank you for being with us today and we, and we hear you. And I don't do we, I don't see any more hands uh, right now. So I I would encourage you or, to reach out. Jessica Hines oh. is waving her hand. Oh oh there. Sorry, Jessica. I didn't I, I didn't see you. You're just Sorry, I couldn't from find me. my but, hand. Um, I'm gonna turn my camera off just because I know my audio is probably not very good. Um, can everyone hear me? Okay. Um, so I just had a, a little statement that I wanted to read. Um, so I'm a school counselor at Berlin. I've been there for about 16 years now. Um, and this year, um, we have two teachers that have been told that they're going to work both at Berlin and Callis next year for the same FTE. Um, <clears throat> they'll teach the same number of classes at, at Berlin as they do now and add on more classes from Callis as well as travel time. Uh, we're not 100% clear on the exacts as the, has the district and the board hasn't really been transparent on the details of things. Um, I'd like to post some questions regarding this issue. Um, has the board asked how this change will affect the teachers with more classes and less prep time? Has the board asked how this change will affect the quality of lessons? How can these teachers provide the same high quality lessons now when they're teaching more and prepping less? Um, has the board asked how this change will affect band and chorus at Berlin? Um, have you thought about how this will affect the U32 band and chorus for, for incoming students um, when you know Berlin has minimal or no band or chorus uh, to seventh grade if it's not able to happen? Um, has the board thought about how these changes will affect the whole child perspective at Berlin and their general education? Um, and I just, you know, really wondering where was the community voice, the involvement and communication in making this decision? And where was transparency is um, what I want to know, because I'm finding out in April that you're being um, moved to potentially moved to a different school and your position being cut a little bit um, is a bit disrespectful. And um, 
really unnecessary when I know the discussion has been happening since uh, January, maybe even before. So um, just think about those questions and, um, you know, it's just something that's really difficult right now um, to, to understand. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I think everybody's been heard. Please raise your hand if somebody else is missing. I, I really want to thank you for, for waiting and for indirectly participating in our retreat and seeing our I know our, our system is going to go through a lot of growth and pain, you know, growing pains through the next few years and and it's going to take a community to support it so i appreciate everybody's come we the board appreciates everybody's coming and your willingness to to wait until we were done uh, we will uh, close the meeting right now and really thank you we we heard what you had to say we hear your questions and 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 we take your input so coming to tonight i want to respect that members this is been the fourth hour of a meeting too. And I would encourage you guys to reach out to the to your building principals and to the superintendent too with more questions in the meantime. So thank you again to everybody. Thank you for the board at the board. Thank you for, especially to all the teachers. It's nice to see so many of you here. And we'll we'll see you at the next meeting to the rest of the board. So you are coming today. Thank you, Nick, for facilitating today. And uh, Susanna already left. And thank you, uh, Brian. Everybody. And it, I believe we need a motion to adjourn or we just say goodbye, but I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Jonas. Uh, all those in favor, please leave the meeting. Say aye. <laughs> Bye. 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 Thank you, everybody. Good night, everybody. Have a good, good night, night, everyone. You too, Abby. Good night. Bye-bye.